Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, well, I'm sure that kind of a few more will be joining, but when I start then, um, and pe as people join, um, just to introduce myself to everybody that's on the line, I mean, it's great to see so many young faces um, with all your enthusiasm about all of these topics and things. So I'm James. Um, I lead on climate, uh, climate and environment issues uh, here at the British Embassy. So I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, your questions and hearing about the subjects that you care about um, and making sure that you have a voice um, on these topics. I'm also looking forward to you asking the ambassador uh, some very difficult questions and putting him on the spot. Um, so please do, please do do that. Um, we have a Q&A box, um, I think, that is open uh, on, on this webinar. Um, please use that to ask questions. And if we have time at the end, we can work through some of those. Um, but also use it to kind of uh, express your opinions and give further views on things. Um, as I say, I'm really keen to hear from you all um, and hear from young people and young voices about these issues. So use it for that purpose as well. Um, obviously, we are here to mark kind of two very important days um, in the calendar. Today is Earth Day. Um, which hopefully you are all aware of, but it's a great chance to kind of celebrate um, environmental and climate action and the work that is going on. Um, so that is kind of the key primary reason we're doing this today. Um, but also tomorrow um, is a public holiday here, where, which is a chance to celebrate children in Turkey. Um, so what better opportunity could we have? Um, sorry, you probably all don't like me calling you children um, and prefer to be youth or something like that instead. Um, but it's a great opportunity to bring you together on this day. Um, to mark those two days and celebrate that. Um, before handing over to the ambassador just to introduce himself to you all, um, can I just say a big thank you to, to Asahan and all of you at Roots and Shoots um, for your kind of help in organising this and kind of bringing this all together with us um, and creating this opportunity. Um, likewise, thank you um, to, to Bessa uh, and the Year 9 students that we have there. Um, it's great to have you on board. And thank you to everyone else who's not in those groups but is joining to hear um, this conversation. Um, as I always say, people don't want to hear from me, we want to hear from the young people. Um, so I will stop there um, and pass over to the ambassador um, and then over to you, Aslahan, uh, to carry on. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, I still think of you as a very young person at heart um, and even have moments of self-delusion about my own youth. Uh, but no, this, is, this, is, um, this is a terrific uh, moment. It's a great opportunity and I'm looking forward very much to hearing uh, various questions and points of view of the participants in today's event. Uh, and it's, uh, it's great that we're doing this on Earth Day. Earth Day was the date, I think, at which the Paris Treaty was uh, agreed. Um, or at least there is a connection between the Paris Treaty and Earth Day. And of course, Earth Day is the day that uh, the United States has uh, relaunched itself as an international player on climate change uh, by hosting the virtual leaders meeting that it's hosting in Washington. Um, so it's a very significant day for international discussions of climate change. Uh, and um, in our small way here in Turkey, we are contributing to the significance of Earth Day. So I'm very ready, if you're ready, to do my best to answer the questions that you have prepared. Thank you very much. Uh, James, should I take the lead? <laughs> yes, please do. Over to you. Thank you. So thank you very much, dear Ambassador and all the British Embassy for having us. And thank you, James and Sanam, especially for organizing and helping us organizing this. This is very special for us, a special day for us. And uh, as Roots and Shoots, we very much care about youths and children's voice. So today is a great opportunity for you and for other people to hear their voice because we are sick of hearing our voices as elders and they have a lot of things to say and they have much more important things to say than us. So I will just uh, give the word to Rumeysa uh, to introduce us and uh, thank you once again and looking very much forward to hearing your answers to youth's questions. <laughs> Hi. Hi, first of all, I want to celebrate all of your 22nd of April International Earth Day and the 23rd of April Turkey's National Sovereignty and the Children's Day. And at the same time, I want to thank the United Kingdom Embassy to make this very gathering meeting happen. My name is Malzumar Rumeysa Legend. 
I am one of the first young members of the Roots Sanctuary's Turkey. Today also has a different kind of importance to me because exactly one year ago, my journey of Roots Sanctuary's Turkey began. And that's the reason I am especially happy to be around you now and introduce you to this huge family that I am part of it. Roots and Shoots is a global movement of youth who are empowered to use their voice and actions to make compassionate decisions, influencing and leading change in their communities. It started in 1991, building on Dr. Jane's legacy and vision for placing the power and placing the power and responsibility to creating solutions to big challenge in hands of young people. Roots and Shoots aims to inspire, empower and encourage young people all over the world. It shows them how to follow their passions, take actions together for the environment, animals and people and become the change our world needs. We as Roots and Shoots Turkey dream of a planet that embarrasses life with all its diversity. We think it's necessary to understand all living things, our environment, our cultural diversity and the functioning of the nature and to transform our lives accordingly for the continuation of life and diversity on our planet. So today we are very happy to be here. Thank you for having us and looking forward to hearing from my friends and you. Thank you very much, Rumeisa. I guess, James, we are ready to ask some questions. Yeah, of course, ready when you are. Do you want to introduce the first, uh, I think Goethe is, is asking the first question, is that correct? Yes, she will be introducing herself. So we're just giving the word to, to them. Thank you, my name is Goethe, I'm 16 years old. I currently reside in Erzurum, which is in the Eastern part of Turkey. And I'm also a young Roots and Shoots Turkey member. And my question is, as the United Kingdom is the birthplace of industrial revolution, we believe you have a much greater role on the causes of ecological issues and the environmental crisis overall when compared to other countries. And since you are the representative of the United Kingdom, do you believe the United Kingdom has a responsibility to take the initiative when it comes to establishing and pursuing sustainable change. Uh, thank you very much for your question, uh, Gökçe. Um, so historically, uh, you're quite right, the Industrial Revolution began in the United Kingdom and it was largely based on coal. It was the burning of coal that powered the Industrial Revolution. And as we know, coal is probably the most polluting um, energy source um, uh, of amongst the various energy sources available to us on this planet. Uh, and I think we have to be conscious that as the, maybe the first country in the world to industrialize, we were at the forefront of the activity that's uh, led to uh, global warming. And uh, I think it's, um, it's important to recognize that other countries who came to industrialization much later than the UK probably feel rather keenly they are being asked to make huge sacrifices uh, when actually their contribution to the overall level of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, for historic reasons is uh, less big than a country like the UK's. Uh, I think that's right. Um, at the same time though, that doesn't help us fix the problem if uh, countries that uh, only recently industrialized and haven't made much of a contribution to global warming so far, uh, decide, well, our priority is going to be economic growth and development, and uh, we need to do this cheaply. And so we're going to continue to burn hydrocarbons in order to pursue our economic goals. And don't you tell us not to do it because uh, you've been polluting since the 18th century, and uh, we've only been going for the last couple of decades. I'm, I mean, although one can understand emotionally why people might say that, it's actually deeply unhelpful because, as we know, every time carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases go into the atmosphere, they stay there for a long time. And we all of us need to be changing our behavior now in order to prevent 
global warming greater than 1.5 degrees, which is the Paris Treaty uh, target. So um, what does that mean for the UK? I think in terms of our um, approach to climate change, we would anyway, regardless of the past, we would anyway want to uh, play a role of some leadership on this question because it's so important. And because uh, we are a permanent member of the, United, of the United Nations Security Council, because we have links all around the world from our days of empire, now inside the Commonwealth, with a great range of countries, uh, many of which are very vulnerable to climate change, uh, we care deeply about this subject. So I think we are an activist, an internationally activist country, and um, it was always going to be the case that the UK would take a leading position. Uh, as you know, I'm sure we are hosting in November the uh, big, big international climate meeting in Glasgow in Scotland. Um, and um, there's a huge amount of work goes into hosting this conference. And uh, that's one way of demonstrating international leadership. At the same time, our prime minister has said um, that climate change and indeed protecting biodiversity is his most important priority, not just for this year when we're hosting COP26, but actually for the years to come. So I think for the United Kingdom, this isn't going away. We will remain um, an active country on this dossier, uh, trying to encourage the world to um, be ambitious in its plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce the threat from climate change. Thank you, Ambassador, um, for that answer. Uh, Aishana, I believe we're coming over to you next for the second question. Yes, the second question comes from me. Uh, I'm Aishana, and I'm now living in Turkey, the eastern, uh, living in Erzurum, the eastern part of Turkey, and I'm 17. Also, I'm a member of Young Roots and Shoots Turkey. Uh, so my question is, now we all know that the UK is not a member of the European Union anymore, but we also know that the European Union has a very significant role in terms of global climate change action. So we, now that the UK left the United the European Union, um, do you think that this departure have changed the climate change policies of the country? I should know, thank you for the question. It's a very interesting question, rather thoughtful question, if I may say so. Um, and it's a question that a number of people in the UK uh, had after the Brexit referendum result in 2016, thought about quite deeply about to what extent uh, in all walks of life will the UK government in the future diverge from the policies adopted by the European Union? And to what extent will we align ourselves and remain the same as the European Union? Now, we know the answer on climate change now. It's quite clear the UK is being more ambitious than the European Union is on climate change. And um, our Prime Minister announced earlier this week that our new target, our new medium term target for reducing blue, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions is to cut them by 78% uh, by the year 2030 compared to 1990. Now, I don't think anywhere, anywhere else in the world that, um, that is an industrialized country has um, a target that is as uh, ambitious and as um, tough as, as that target. Um, the European Union, inevitably, the European Union, when it reaches a common policy on a subject, it is a compromise between different member states' views on a subject. And you have a number of countries in the European Union who are not at the forefront of uh, wanting to make big changes in order to stop global warming. And you have other countries that are very much like-minded with the UK. I would say Denmark, Sweden, for example, the Netherlands are very similar to the UK in, um, in the uh, 
range of our ambition. But then there are other countries that are different. So I think almost inevitably the European Union on climate change is going to be adopting policies that are slightly less ambitious than the UK can do by itself. Having said that, of course, the European Union is a much bigger player in the world economy than the UK is. And um, the European Union, for example, in adopting policies like it's, uh, you may have heard it has a policy called the Green Deal, where uh, it, will, it may be imposing um, extra taxes on imports from countries um, where goods are not being produced in a low carbon way. So if you continue with rather traditional industry and you try and export your products to the European Union in future, you will have to pay extra taxes because you're um, you know, using a lot of carbon in making them. And um, the European Union can do that because of its scale and size. And I think that will have quite an effect in countries that export into the European Union. Whereas the UK is just not a big enough market really to make as, uh, the same difference. So I think there are areas where the European Union will have greater influence just, through, just because of its size. Um, but because the UK can now adopt independently a course to stop global warming, I think we can be more ambitious than we could be before. So I think that's how it balances out. Thank you so much for your answer. Great, thank you. Two, two great questions from Erzurum uh, there that we've had. It's great to see kind of the range of cities there and people in cities that are interested in these topics. Uh, Mina, I believe we're coming to you for the third question. Hello, my name is Mina. I'm 15. I'm from Istanbul and I'm a Rutsensius Turkey member. The question I would like to ask is, what do you think should be done regionally, nationally and even internationally in order to find solutions to the global environmental problems we are facing today? As the embassy, what kind of solutions are you currently working on? Okay. Um, it's a very broad question, so I will try and, I'll try and give you a, a, a decent answer, but I'm not sure I'll cover everything. Um, I think the, uh, what the plan, what we all need to do, what all countries need to do globally, is reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero. Not reduce them by 50% or by 75% or by 90%, reduce them to zero. And in some areas where you can't if there are areas where you can't stop greenhouse gas emissions, like, I don't know, uh, rearing cattle, cows and beef and, um, and sheep and what have you, uh, then you need to find a way for compensating for the uh, greenhouse gas uh, that those animals emit. But essentially the target must be net zero for everybody and everybody should feel obliged to try and achieve net zero. Um, because if we don't, if there's even a few countries that continue to put out greenhouse gases, then those greenhouse gases stay in the atmosphere and our ability to stop global warming is undermined. So everybody has to do it. There's no, there's no, um, no, uh, no excuses. Obviously, some countries will find that more difficult than other countries because their science is less advanced or their economies are less well developed uh, or they're poorer and those countries need to be helped. So there's a difference then between the obligations of richer countries and uh, poorer countries. It's very important that the richer countries help out the poorer countries in making the transformation to their economies that is required uh, in order to stop greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that will vary around the world. So there are parts of the world where there might, you might have a concentration of uh, poorer countries and parts of the world like Europe, for example, where actually on the whole, there aren't really any poor countries uh, in Europe. Um, so different regions will have different mixes, but essentially I think that's, there's a global obligation on us all. And then there's a regional obligation on richer countries to help the poor countries. Um, and then, you know, you can break that down further. Um, you know, how do we achieve net zero emissions globally? We achieve it by individual countries taking policies at the nation state level that will achieve the net zero. Um, 
So I think that's, uh, that's the area where this, the, uh, the nation state uh, comes in. Uh, but that's just on climate change. I mean, there's, um, you know, protecting the environment, because your question was quite wide. Protecting the environment includes lots of other things like, um, you know, removing plastic from the oceans or improving the quality of air in our cities. Um, uh, and you can no doubt, by protecting biodiversity and habitats. These are all very important. Um, uh, there, I think, uh, I mean, it's, it is, um, I mean, there are various international agreements that we should all hold ourselves to, to improve things, but quite a lot of this action is actually quite local. That, um, for example, in the United Kingdom, one of the issues that's quite topical at the moment, because we've sadly had a case of a young woman who died and the coroner uh, said the cause of her death was through the air pollution in the city that she lived. Um, that the question of air pollution is quite topical at the moment in the UK. And I think we will see uh, steps being taken by uh, the uh, administration in the UK to force uh, cities to clean up the air um, in which so many of our citizens are, uh, are living. Um, I think in terms of biodiversity and habitats, we all have a major interest in what's going on in Brazil and in preserving the tropical rainforest. And uh, there are various international campaigns to do that. But ultimately, it's the Brazilian government who is responsible for the stewardship or looking after the tropical rainforests and all the biodiversity that lives in them. And we have to persuade the Brazilian government that that's the right thing to be doing and not chopping down the forest in order to create more agricultural land. That's quite hard to do if you're not in Brazil and you're not part of the Brazilian government. And then on the issue of plastics, where um, the British environmentalist Sir David Attenborough led a, uh, a, a big international campaign a, a few years ago to persuade us all about the damage that plastics was doing to our environment and the importance of um, moving away from plastics, certainly single use plastics. I think, um, you know, that, that's a, a really a question, largely a question at the moment of the individuals in our societies taking individual decisions to use plastic less. And unfortunately, I think one of the setbacks of the COVID crisis has been that more and more things are now being put in plastic bags than before in order to stop transmission of the coronavirus. So our attempts to stop the use of plastic um, have been set back by the pandemic um, and it's been more difficult for people to make individual choices about not using plastic. Uh, but I hope we'll return to that. And you ask what the embassy is doing on these issues. Well, we're not doing much on the greenhouse gas emission side of things um, at the moment. Um, but uh, we have planted trees. We are trying to... There's a, um, a forest that we, ev uh, every year, um, people from the embassy go out and plant trees for a couple of days in the forest and we plant trees on our own compound. So we make a contribution that way. And we've also had a campaign to stop the use of plastics as far as possible in the embassy. So I think on habitats and on plastics, we have a reasonable record. I think I'm afraid though on sort of, um, uh, on reducing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. I think it's a bit more difficult for us uh, as things stand. But that's our, that's our record and we know we need to do better. So um, there's no harm at all in being reminded, being put on the spot and being reminded that we all need to make bigger efforts. So thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much for answering. Thank you, yeah, and, and a good challenge for all of us here at the embassy um, to play our individual role in, in all of those activities as well as looking at the bigger picture. Um, and the international side of things. Um, we're now going to uh, turn to Bessa for, for one of your questions that we have at the school there. Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. I'm 13 and I go to the British Embassy School in, here in Ankara. And uh, my question was, how has the coronavirus affected any work that the UK has been doing about the climate crisis? Because as we all know, at the start of the pandemic, the majority of flights were banned or stopped and this resulted in reduced carbon emissions. 
Has this helped the UK reach any of its climate goals and how beneficial was it to the environment in Britain? Thank you for your question. I'm afraid I didn't catch your name um, at the beginning. Alicia. Alicia, Alicia, hello. Uh, hello. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and you've probably seen the videos on YouTube and elsewhere of uh, wild animals coming into the cities now that are, you know, it, particularly during lockdown periods when there were fewer cars on the streets and many fewer people around. Um, it was quite, uh, it, was, it was quite good fun actually looking at some of these videos of wild animals coming into cities. Uh, and it's also true um, that uh, with many fewer flights than before, um, the contribution from aviation and transport generally to global uh, greenhouse emissions has been reduced. Um, so I suppose there has been a, a contribution, but we need to keep it in perspective because um, that reduction in transport and uh, those periods of lockdown are very exceptional and they will, I hope, come to an end before too long. And life as it was before will continue because people still want to travel um, and people will still want to be busy getting out and about, um, whether they're shopping or going to school or university or visiting friends and family or going on holiday or going to work. So I think that was only a temporary reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And the, um, the task for all of us, I think, is, as I was saying in answer to the first question, uh, is uh, although we've had a little bit of relief, um, that relief won't last uh, very long. Um, and when we get back to business as normal, when we get back to normal living, when flights are restarted, uh, when we're no longer under curfews at the weekends or in the evenings, uh, and these restrictions are a thing of the past, that we must make individual choices about how we lead our lives to reduce uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, and we must um, lobby our governments to adopt policies uh, that make a difference because despite the fact that there has been this reduction of greenhouse gases during the pandemic, the pandemic you know, may last a year and a half, it may last two years, these special restrictions, but in the great sweep of history, it's, uh, it's only a blip. And we need our economies. You know, we, um, the, this reduction in activity, this reduction in transport, in aviation, um, in activity inside our, um, inside our countries, uh, that reduction is, has come at a, a striking economic cost. And it's not good for our societies that they should be poorer and that people um, should have uh, reductions in their standards of living. And because that doesn't make them more inclined to address the issue of climate change. Because um, it's often people um, who are struggling to make a living who may say, look, I act you know, I realize climate change is important, but actually my main issue this week is to pay the rent on my flat and to be able to afford to run my car and um, put food on the table. And until I can sort those problems out, I'm not gonna have the kind of headspace to think about uh, saving the planet. So um, we need to get our economies going and going strongly. Um, uh, because I think that will help. Um, and in getting our economies to grow back strongly, uh, we need our governments to take policies that encourage the, the economic recovery around the world to be a green economic recovery, be as far as possible a carbon-free economic recovery. So we need governments to set ambitious targets for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and we need industry in particular to take note of the signals from government and adjust their own manufacturing processes and design and manufacture products that serve the objective of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to zero uh, in time. And one area where the UK has done this, I only know about the UK's experience, so I can't talk about other countries, 
But one area is that we have announced that we will uh, ban, we will prohibit the sale of new vehicles in the UK which use petrol or diesel from, I think, the year of 2030. That's an extraordinary target. There will be no new cars sold in the UK after 2030 in nine years' time if uh, they're, they're, they have the traditional internal combustion engine that burns petrol or diesel. It's that sort of signal to industry which will make the difference. And that's the sort of signal that will enable us to grow our economies after the pandemic back to a high performance, a level of high performance, in a way that's most likely to bring along our people and our societies to continue to support climate change and bring about the change we need to see. Thank you. Thank you, that was very interesting. Great, um, thank you. And we'll be coming back um, to you, Alicia and Ozan shortly um, for, for another question. Um, but we're gonna turn to Omer now um, for an exciting question, which is one I've been looking forward to about recycling. Um, so over to you, Omer, I believe. Hi, I'm Omer. I live in the central part of Turkey, Konya, and I'm uh, also a recent Turkey member. And before I ask my question, I would like to thank the dear ambassador for having all of us here today. And um, you have mentioned about plastic usage and my question is related about it. My question is, um, we know that the United Kingdom's recycling policies set an example to the world. You're very sensitive to recycling. However, we also know that the United Kingdom's waste was bought by Turkey and burned in Adana Çukurova region, which is used as agricultural land. Both countries have responsibilities at this issue. Do you think it's fair? If you think it's not, why the United Kingdom maintains sending it, even though it knows that the plastic waste is not recycled? Yeah, um, I mean, thank you for your question. Um, I don't know. Thing, I don't think I know enough about the, the case that you mentioned to give you a, um, the answer that your question deserves. But I'm going to have a go at it. Um, I imagine that the plastic that was sent to Turkey to be burnt uh, was sent by a private company in the UK. Uh, um, and it was a private company that uh, has to obey the law. Um, and if it was legal for this private company to um, gather together plastic waste and then sell it for uh, destruction in Turkey, and if it could make a profit while it was doing that, then I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that companies will try and do that. The question is, the, the environmental question is, should that be happening? And I'm inferring from your question that you think rather strongly that it shouldn't happen. And I have to say that's my own instincts as well, that it doesn't sound like an environmentally good practice to be burning plastic at all, because um, it must produce the most awful noxious gases and therefore, I think, you know, it's up to um, the governments in the UK and the government of Turkey to uh, pass laws that make it clear that this is an unacceptable thing to do. Now, the plastic's not being burnt in the UK, um, so it's more difficult maybe in the UK to pass a law that says, you know, you shall not gather plastic, send it overseas for it to be burnt. Um, but I think in, a, in the receiving country, uh, there, um, it would be possible to, to have a law that says, you know, plastic on, on this scale should not be burnt. And, um, and that may be the case already in Turkey. So I'm not, in, I'm not entirely sure of all the details and the facts about the example that you mentioned. Um, you're, you're right, though, in saying that um, the UK has been interested in recycling for quite a long time, but then so is Turkey. I'm very conscious that um, the recycling, the zero waste approach uh, in Turkey is led by the wife of the head of state of the president. It's, it's Mrs. Erdogan who's uh, behind um, um, the zero waste approach and the promotion of recycling here in Turkey. So this is, um, uh, this is practice that gets endorsement from the very top here. And I'm sure that's a reflection of uh, what a serious matter this is and how seriously it is, um, it is taken in Turkey. Uh, 
when I was um, a teenager, which is quite a long time ago now, maybe it was slightly later than that, um, when I was in my 20s, I remember our then Prime Minister, who was a woman called Margaret Thatcher, trying to get people interested in the UK in picking up litter. We were quite a grubby country in the 1980s, and we weren't as neat and tidy as Mrs. Thatcher felt that we should. And she went out into the park in one of the parks near Downing Street where she worked um, with one of these um, tools for picking up litter off the grass. And she, the cameras filmed her picking up litter as though she were a park keeper. And this was how she made her point about the importance of uh, picking up litter. And I think since then, the, you know, there has been a rising consciousness and awareness in the UK about how unseemly waste is anyway. I mean, how unattractive it looks to be somewhere where there's rubbish around, but also increasingly um, how it's damaging to the environment. It's damaging, uh, well, you think about um, all the plastic in the oceans and the effect that has on wildlife in the oceans or indeed birds uh, that either get caught up in the plastic or eat the plastic by mistake. So it's damaging uh, to the environment in that respect, but also the cost of continually producing new stuff, um, the cost in terms of the environmental pollution of continuing to use stuff and the use of resources, which may become more and more scarce, is significant. So what we have to try and find, what we have to try and do is find the right economic incentives for business and for individuals uh, to want to recycle in their own interests. I'm not certain how effective a recycling program is if somewhere in the program there is no economic incentive to make it work. So the people who gather the waste, um, who collect all the plastic bottles or whatever else they're collecting, or the old batteries, um, they're, they, there needs to be a market for what they're collecting. Um, and there needs to be a process then which enables all those plastic bottles to be recycled in a way that makes them usable and therefore have some value second time around. And these are quite complex technical matters, but I think that's the key. I think getting the economic incentive right is probably the key to a successful um, recycling program. And I think that um, supporting that economic incentive with very high level political endorsement as uh, Mrs. Erdogan does in Turkey, as Mrs. Thatcher did all those years ago uh, in the UK, is also very important as well. And I've just come back to where we started. I don't know enough about the particular case of the plastic being burnt, being brought from the UK to Turkey to, to being burnt um, here. Uh, I don't know enough about it really to give you a, um, a detailed answer of why it happened, how, how it could happen and how it can be prevented in future. But I must say, I do rather share your instinct that it sounds like a a very bad thing from the environmental point of view. Uh, hopefully one day we can do a beach cleanup with you, dear ambassador, and maybe you can get other ambassadors as well and we can raise more awareness and whole British embassy team. That would be great. Um, so James, is it Bezos' turn, I guess? Yeah, that's right. Um, back, back to Bessa for the next question. Um, yes, hello. Uh, my name is um, Ozan. Um, I'm also a student here. I'm 14. Um, and my question is, uh, you know, the greenhouse effect has a huge impact on the UK, you know, with the um, global warming, the icebergs are melting, which will cause sea levels to rise further, which of course will affect the UK and um, other island nations to some degree. What are the prevention strategy strategies strategies being put in place and your thoughts on the matter. Rosanne, thank you very much for the question about sea level rise. I sometimes think that um, when you're trying to work out what the consequences of global warming are, you think of extreme weather events, very, you know, strong winds, droughts, uh, floods, all these kind of things. But actually maybe the more dangerous one or the more threatening one over the medium long term is sea level rise because um, as the polar ice caps melt, as the great 
ice sheets in Greenland and other places like that as they melt, uh, they are pouring huge volumes of extra water into the oceans. And um, a very, very large percentage of the human population on the planet lives quite close to the coastline. I mean, it's, I'm saying this in Anchor, of course, where it doesn't really apply, but um, in lots of places, you know, the more attractive parts of the country to live in are by the coast. And, uh, and in some countries, those coastlines can be very low lying. So the number of people who will be forced to move uh, as a result of sea level rise is really very significant. So um, yeah, it's a big, it's a really big threat. I was, um, I was high commissioner, which is like being an ambassador. I was high commissioner um, uh, to the Maldives for a couple of years, although I didn't live in the Maldives, worse luck. But um, I, so I used to go to the Maldives fairly often. As you probably know, the kind of highest point in the Maldives is about three meters above sea level. And, and the majority of the Maldives is about a meter or less above sea level. So this is a whole country, a whole community that could disappear as a result of, of uh, sea level rise if we're not careful, which is why it's so important that we have to keep in mind that the big objective in all of this is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because it's the greenhouse gas emissions and the greenhouse effect which is uh, causing the, arc, the polar ice caps to melt um, and which is causing the sea level to rise. So it's a really, it's a really important point. Um, in the, I, mean, I, don't, I can't speak for Turkey, but I know in the UK, um, flooding is one of the major concerns of um, our government. Uh, which is a consequence both of heavy rain and heavier rain than usual, but also <clears throat> it's not unrelated to the fact that we are uh, an island with a lot of coastline and we need to have better coastal defences. So we are, there's a lot of money being set aside for building essentially seawalls around uh, the United Kingdom in vulnerable spots to protect those areas of the United Kingdom from being flooded. And the best example of this in the world is in the Netherlands. If you go to Holland, you probably know about the dikes in Holland and the, and the, and the system there. But um, they've, they had to show the world, oh, you know, several hundred years ago, how you could live um, in a land, parts of which are below sea level, um, and how you, can, how you can do so successfully. And they produced many, many great engineers who were able to sort of hold the sea back. Um, and I think that's going to be, we're going to have to learn how to do that uh, in places all around the world um, until we can stop uh, global warming and the consequent sea level rise. But it's a really, it's a really, really important point. Thank you for raising it. Thank you for answering. Great, uh, thank, thank you all. Um, Elif, over to you for, for the next question. Hi, uh, I'm Elif. I'm 17 years old and I currently live in Istanbul and I'm an active member of Roots and Shoots Turkey. So my question is, do you think that the education system is sufficient enough for us young people to grow up as responsible individuals who think and question the climate change based on science? Elif, thank you for your, thank you for your question. Um, I'm not an expert in the education system in Turkey. So I don't know the answer about whether or not you have enough science in your curriculum um, to, um, to understand what is at stake with climate change. But I hope that you do. I mean, I, I think it's very important uh, that people should have um, or should be taught science uh, in a way that enables them to think critically about these questions, because um, maybe a bit less so on climate change these days, but there are always conspiracy theorists out there. We all have to live with that's part of the world we live in because of the, um, you know, the digital world and the social media and all the rest of it seems to encourage that way of thinking. And there, is, there always seem to be people who are prepared to take an unscientific position on matters of huge importance, whether that's in the pandemic and vaccinations or indeed whether it's about climate change. So it's really important that young people uh, when they leave school 
are able critically to look at claims that are being made about climate or about vaccinations or other things and um, you know decide for themselves uh, what looks to be correct and based on the evidence and what looks to be just fantasy scaremongering um, or um, you know or otherwise not soundly based um, so I, I mean I don't know how I mean I I guess you were at a private school um, in Turkey, so, so yeah. you, your school may not be typical of the um, Turkish national curriculum. But um, and I know that I know there's a lot of interest um, in raising the standards of um, the curriculum in Turkey, uh, and there are a lot of Turkey produces a lot of engineers and a lot of scientists. So I think the country must be doing some things right in this area. But I very much hope that people who leave school a have the scientific background to understand these complex issues and secondly have the critical thinking that's required in order to be able to distinguish between you know what is nonsense what is fake news as president trump would have said and what is actually good science and to be able to then argue and support the position um, supported by good science so i hope that answers your your question Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. And I should say, um, please do use that Q&A box um, to, to raise your own questions and thoughts about these topics. Um, and I, I share with the ambassador that I don't know enough about the Turkish education system either. Um, so please do kind of help us learn about some of these things as well as we go on. Um, Digile Melis, over to you for, for our next question, I believe. Hi, Ambassador. Um, I'm glad to be here and be able to uh, ask our questions and discuss about these topics. So um, I'm the member of the Roots and Shoots Turkey. I'm 16 years old and I live in Istanbul. So here's my question. Uh, the embassy has works in the field of climate crisis and environment problems. So where do the young people stand here? And how can you support us as well as how we can support you? We all that know global crisis experienced regardless by any age, religion, language. So how can our voices and opinions be included in the works? Um, thank you very much, uh, Tichli, for your question. So my, um, my answer, which is not meant to be flippant or facetious or funny is talk to your grandparents. So I think young people, the relationship between grandchildren and grandparents um, is often a very strong, very loving relationship. In fact, um, I mean, they, people can be very close. And it's often grandparents who are more conscious of the world that is being left behind for their grandchildren than maybe even the parents are. And grandchildren have a tremendous influence over their grandparents. Now, not everybody has grandparents. But for those of us, uh, for, the, for those of you, sorry, I don't have any grandparents now, although I'm a grandparent myself, but um, those of you who still have grandparents, uh, talk to your grandparents about these questions because your grandparents will likely be either in positions of influence or they will know people in positions of influence or they will know how to lobby for a better future for their grandchildren. And they'll be deeply emotionally committed to doing so. So I think that's one thing you can be doing. I think secondly, um, there are individual choices that we can all take. It doesn't matter what age we are, whether we're in our teens or whether we're in our 60s or whether we're even more old and decrepit. I think there are, there are individual choices we can take in our daily lives that can make things better or make things worse. And quite a lot of those individual choices are about the way we travel, about the things we buy, about the things we throw away, about the things we try and keep and repair. And we have a pretty good sense, all of us, of what we should be doing to reduce waste and reduce carbon and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Whether that's eating a little bit less meat than we used to, for example, whether that's um, you know using glass rather than plastic and recycling glass, whatever it might be, there are lots of different things we can do. So we can all do that at the individual level. Then I think 
um, there are organizations that young people can join, like Roots and Shoots, where you can have an effect, you can lobby, you can advocate, you can argue, you can persuade, you can have a voice in society, whether that's in the digital media or in a more kind of orthodox conventional way, like talking to your um, to the mayors of your local districts or uh, to the um, to your MPs, your um, members of parliament. So there's a certain amount that young people can do. And actually, because this is clearly an issue, climate change is clearly an issue which will affect young people more than it will affect older people, because, you know, you'll be on the planet for longer than we will be. Um, I think the news system, the media, are quite interested in what young people have to say and in the actions that young people take to express their desire for a less polluted, cleaner, safer planet for mankind in the future. So I think you will find the media are quite open to hearing from young people if the young people are organized in ways uh, that makes the delivery of the message appealing. And of course, the great example of this is, um, I won't pronounce the name correctly, but Greta Thunberg, who's the great Swedish activist, who uh, shown that it doesn't matter how kind of young or small or, or whatever you're doing, if you're determined, you can really, really make a difference. And, um, and I think she, you know, she has been an example uh, of, um, well, she's been an example of getting the message out and making people pay attention to the issue whether or not, you know, you know, particularly people who perhaps weren't paying much attention, suddenly realizing actually this is a young person who's speaking for her generation. And that's extremely important. And then I guess there are also some sort of formal bodies um, in the context of COP, COP26 this year. Um, we're co-hosting it, as you may know, with or co, we're co-presidency with Italy. And the Italians have organized a COP26 youth event uh, in the middle of this year. And there will be other youth organizations that will have the opportunity in the course of this year to contribute to COP, including um, at the meeting in Glasgow in November, where these meetings are usually surrounded by, there's a sort of central negotiation that goes on, but there's a kind of environment around it of exhibitions and uh, demonstrations and uh, events. And there's normally a big youth element in all of that. So there'll be, I would expect, this is COVID permitting, if there is a physical uh, meeting in Glasgow, COP26, of a traditional type, there will be a big youth dimension to that as well. But I go back to where I started. I think actually the big difference you can all make is persuade your grandparents this really matters to you and ask them what they're doing to help uh, make the world that you're going to inherit uh, a better place to live. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Gokche is raising her hand. Do we have time to add something, James? Yes, please, please, let's do. Thank you. And as you were talking about the things that you were planning to establish in the United Kingdom, we also wanted to raise another question to you because we as the young generation want our voices to be heard. This is one of our first and foremost wishes. So would it be possible for the United Kingdom Embassy to let us be involved in decision-making organisms or joint campaigns in the near future? Or would it, if the United Kingdom Embassy could provide other ways of helping us to be a part of the solution, what would those be? Okay, well, the embassy here in Turkey uh, is involved on climate change in uh, several different ways. One is we work closely with the Turkish government, with the climate change negotiators, uh, with the ministries of energy, uh, environment, foreign affairs, and I hope with finance as well before too long, um, in order to support Turkish efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to find ways in which we hope to encourage the Turkish government to be even more ambitious in its program of, of reducing greenhouse gases. Now, to be honest, I'm not sure there's a role 
from people outside government in that dialogue that we have. A uh, second way in which we are uh, active here is in our kind of public campaigning, where we are involved in various events like today, which have a climate change theme and where we're hoping not just to raise awareness of the risks of climate change, because I think they're quite widely known, but to raise awareness of the need for action, of awareness of what the right kind of action is and awareness of how urgent it is to take that action. And there, I think we want to work with lots of different groups around society because we see these different groups in Turkey as themselves uh, able to talk to their contacts and friends and networks and spread the message even more widely. So I think an event like today where uh, your, you and your colleagues and friends uh, in Roots and Shoots already have a sense of how important this subject is and maybe we can give some ideas and material either in the course of these discussions or subsequently to you uh, if there are particular areas where you want more evidence or more arguments to use with other people to support your your goals, then I'm sure you know we'd be happy to to work with you on on that. And then, as as indeed um, uh, was mentioned earlier, there may be maybe be some sort of active activities that we could do together if we um, all end on a beach somewhere near Marmara and are picking up uh, plastic and uh, generally trying to improve the um, improve the environment. We could maybe do a few things together then. Although I'm not sure how many of the embassy people I would allow to go to Marmara all at the same time, because some of them have to be here to do their day jobs. Thank you, dear ambassador. We will appreciate all of your support and guidance on this matter. Great, Th thank you for that, that question. Um, I think it's great to think about ways we can continue this um, collaboration and continue hearing these voices after today. Um, I'm aware that we're kind of running through our time very quickly um, and I think we are now to our final question um, which is from Ada, um, unless I'm mistaken. Yes, hi my name is Ada, I am 16 years old and I live in Antalya. I am a Roots and Shoots member of, uh, of Turkey. Um, and my question is that, that um, does the UK embassy consider taking action with the NGOs and the youth about environmental issues? Would you think about establishing a committee with us and the teenagers in the UK? And what responsibility will you take in establishing intergenerational dialogue? Yeah. Um, these are they, all there's all very good points. Um, I'm not sure as an embassy in, obviously in Turkey, in a foreign country, uh, that we can do very much on promoting intergenerational dialogue here, other than through our kind of public campaigns. I mean, I've done a bit of trying to in encourage intergener in intergenerational dialogue today in suggesting that people should talk to their grandparents about, young people should talk to their grandparents about climate change. Um, but I think this is really for uh, civil society organizations to be doing themselves uh, rather than for us as a foreign embassy to be doing. Um, but I do think as part of our engagement with Turkish society and the Turkish public, um, we have done quite a lot with um, NGOs in Turkey. And it's certainly our objective to do even more with NGOs and with civil society organizations uh, in the future on this important subject because raising awareness and uh, raising awareness of the need for action and of the right kind of action is, uh, we believe, um, very important all around the world, um, including here and including in the UK, including in you know, anywhere, any country around the world. So we're not going to stop doing that. So I think the appetite and the desire in the embassy to work with civil society organizations um, will remain as high as before. And I think an organization like yours, uh, uh, with its interest in climate and the environment, um, is a very good organization to stay in touch with the British Embassy on. So we'd be happy, we'd be happy to do that, I'm sure. Um, whether we can put you in touch with other kind of teenage groups in the UK, I just, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I expect we, can, we could um, help a bit on that. 
But I think ultimately it will be for the the groups in the UK and for your group to want to do this enough to to make the connections if we can identify some counterparts. But maybe we can just we might be able to think about what that looks like in the UK, and if we can do a kind of e introduction to you, we would then I think um, leave it to you and to your British counterparts to work out what you do with it. Um, but uh, it's an intriguing idea. I think the idea of young people across the world in different countries forming a common bond on this issue is uh, it's very natural and it could be quite uh, influential. So, I mean, I hope, I hope we, can, um, uh, we can help you um, do some of that with, uh, with, with British teenagers. Great, thank you. Well, unless I've forgotten anyone, and, and please do tell me if I have, um, I think that is the end of our, our questions um, today. And um, so thank you all for, for kind of asking such great questions and such a wide range of questions um, that have really touched on uh, uh, broad issues from kind of recycling and plastics through to kind of global action um, and, and local action as well. And um, so it's been great to hear all of those. Um, Ambassador Aslan, I don't know if you have any final words, but just from me, just to say thank you to everybody um, for your participation today. And I personally definitely want to keep in touch with all of you um, to make sure we continue this dialogue. Um, uh, on behalf of Roots and Shoots Turkey, I would like to thank you again. And we're looking very much forward to hearing from you and act together and do things together and raise awareness together with the, uh, with the youth's voice and children's voice. And uh, Aslan, if I may say as well, James, just um, uh, say it. it's been very stimulating, rather interesting. I didn't know about Roots and Shoots before this, um, but it's... Um, it's great to meet you all and to hear about your uh, serious concern uh, on climate change and for the future of the planet. And I'm sure there are more things we can do together. So um, yeah, let's stay in touch on this uh, really vital question. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.